Hello, welcome to the Classical Top 5 podcast. I'm Tommy Pearson and joining me as always are Fiona Maddox from The Observer and Richard Bratby from The Spectator. Last week's edition on the Top 5 Works Since 1980 encouraged many of you contributing your own lists on social media. Thank you so much for that. They made fascinating reading, certainly made me realise just how much music I need to catch up on. It's and particularly satisfying to read about composers I've never heard of. Lots of listening ahead of me and the others, I'm sure. Um, there is a playlist on Spotify of the music that we chose, and you can find the link to that on the podcast website and on our Facebook page as usual. So what's our topic this week? Well, it's just as challenging, given the huge number of works that qualify. It's top five sacred works. And our special guest is a composer who, as it happens, featured quite a lot in last week's edition. Uh, he's one of the world's most performed living composers and his sacred works are at the heart of his output. Many of them are now standard repertoire, not something you can say about that many contemporary composers. It is, of course, Sir James Macmillan. James, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, join us on Classical Top 5. Just tell us a little bit about how you've been dealing with lockdown. What have you, what have you been up to? Well, in, in some ways, life hasn't been very much different uh, to usual. And I suppose it might be like that for lots of composers. Um, composers have to inhabit a space of a, a kind of necessary solitude and silence. Uh, we've, we've kind of prepared ourselves for this, in a sense. It's, it's what we do. And obviously, many of us do other things. But, and it's all those other things that have closed down um, all, all my concerts, all my uh, visits to universities and so on, all my talks, uh, that's all stopped. Um, and like my colleagues who are performing musicians, that life has stopped. However, with me, it just allows me to go on with the day job, as it were. Uh, I've got an awful lot of music written uh, since this happened. And, uh, and in that sense, I'm, I'm grateful. Yeah, presumably, I mean, your, your relationship with performers is important. Of course it is, because somebody's going to be playing your music. But presumably, as a successful composer, you're actually writing music for, for performances that are quite some way ahead, are you? And therefore, rather hoping that, mm. that uh, these things will, in fact, go ahead. That's true. But, but even the, the works I've completed, I've no idea, really, um, when they're going to be performed. One of them, the, the, the piece I finished at, right at the beginning of the year was my Christmas oratorio. And the perfor first performance of that is scheduled for December this year, the London Philharmonic Orchestra. I don't think that will happen, to be honest. Um, they, they haven't de declared anything yet. But uh, So I don't think it's cancellations as such that I'm dealing with. It's postponements. And uh, the other two pieces are for March and April next year, a piece for the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra. I, I really, you know, in my heart of heart, wonder whether those concerts will go ahead or whether those pieces will have to be postponed too. But we live in hope and, and I genuinely think life will come back, a concert life will come back one way or another and, and, the, and this music I've completed will be performed. But so many composers talk about how even if you don't have a commission, it's important to just keep composing. Every day you need to do something, perhaps. Are, are you that person as well? Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, if I, if I didn't have to, if I wasn't being asked to write this music, I, I would want to continue doing it. It's, it, it just comes, the, it's the most instinctive and natural thing to me. I wouldn't know what else to do, to be honest. Uh, and I suppose in that sense, we're all preparing for the future. Um, we might not be here in the future when this music is performed and uh, deep down that's what keeps us going but we're not just writing for December or March next year we're, we're writing for hopefully 50 100 years from now and that this music will still have a life then one hopes well we specialize on this podcast in setting people completely impossible tasks um, this is certainly one of them but I would imagine it was pretty difficult for you to select five sacred works um, before you say what your first one is, what, what sort of criteria did you set yourself for this task? Well, uh, I'm glad I was given carte blanche and, and told to go my own way with this because there's a lot of criteria involved in the discussion of sacred music. I'm involved in this discussion a lot. And it ranges from people who uh, simply 
want to regard sacred music as church music. You know, it might just be the music they do for their local church. Um, I know many musicians are not necessarily professional musicians, but are, are volunteers in their local community and trying to get music that they, they, they can use with their choir of volunteers or, or just simple music that a congregation can sing. That is sacred music. That is sacred music to them um, and it's sacred music to me. But then, of course, there's a whole swathe of another direction, uh, including one view that, that would hold that all music is sacred. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's slightly pantheistic, uh, a bit vague perhaps, but uh, I can understand that as well. And there's, there are people who claim that, and they'll claim that a lot of secular music and symphonic music is, is sacred. And there is something in that. Um, people who love music, whether they're religious conventionally or not, will nevertheless talk about uh, music as being the most spiritual of the arts and I, I meet those people all the time and they're not necessarily religious people in the, the way that I might be. There's that vast uh, expanse of definition uh, of, about what sacred music is. Some of the music I've chosen has been written for specifically for liturgy originally but some of it is definitely not and there's one piece in particular might surprise listeners uh, because it's very very secular but a case can be made out for its um, numinous qualities. Ah, so what, what is your first choice then let's kick off. Well I thought it'd go right back to the beginning I suppose that if I was going right back to the beginning I'd be looking at a piece of Gregorian chant and chant is incorporated into this piece in a way and in fact you could say that Gregorian chant has been the DNA of a lot of the Western canon, right from the early days especially. Uh, and that chant has its roots in the early centuries after Christ. Um, but I suppose uh, uh, for me, a light went on. When I was a teenager, I was given this wonderful box set of music from the Gothic era, which highlighted uh, the scholarship and musicianship of David Munro, who was one of those early music pioneers in the 60s and 70s. And this was a revelation to me. I had already woken up to wonderful sacred music, music of Palestrina, Victoria, Bach, I was singing and playing. But here was music that was much, much earlier than that. And the piece that really struck me, or the, the two composers that really struck me, were the earliest uh, on, on the, in the box set. They were Leonin and Periton from the 12th century. The first examples of composed music, or um, you could say polyphonic music, with, with Leonin, the very earliest composer, is ground bass, extenuating the notes and putting composed lines above it, in Leonin's case, maybe just one or two. But with Periton, who's just slightly later, uh, you can hear two lines, three lines. You can hear these long notes of the, of the, the plain chant, the, the, the ground bass, as it were, stretched out. And then this incredible invention over the top of it, the beginning of it all, the beginning of Western music. Uh, so my first choice is Vida and Omnis, by Periton, which we think was written in 1198 um, for use, liturgical use, at Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Has anyone else on here got anything close as far as the date is concerned for sacred music? Fiona? You... I um, had both those composers on my very, very long list, which is, probably has about 45 pieces on it. Um, but I'd, I'd put in that same um, era, Hildegard of Bingen, a, la a single line of chant, although you can certainly hear performances in which there's a kind of rock rhythm or um, all sorts of drones going on, but I th uh, only the line of chant survives. And she also was 12th century. And uh, I think um, it, 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 it takes you to a very different place. And I think that's quite good for us all at the moment. Richard, going to you, what, what about one of your choices? Well, uh, um, shockingly, uh, it's, it's, this, this beginning to the conversation has made me just think about the, how circumscribed my own musical world, my own musical listening is. I'm one is aware of this, these vast consonants, these expanses of music sort of before the standard concert repertoire. The earliest composer on my list um, was Haydn. I'm probably going to begin with Mozart, and it's an entire sort of way of looking at religious music. And the piece I chose. I could choose almost any of the sacred music he wrote before he left Salzburg, or anything he wrote in that sort of first two thirds of his life. Um, I just picked out as 
you know, particularly perfect and wonderful example, the Exultate Jubilate, the motet um, written for a castrato and small orchestra, which ends with the famous Alleluia, uh, but has, has so much going on before then. And the, the whole, the whole question about sort of Mozart's sacred music and the music of the sacred music of the classical period is the fact it doesn't really seem to exist to us in a world apart from the, the rest of the composer's output. It's, it's Mozart's language, it's Mozart's world, it's all of a piece for him. It just pours out. This piece, Exultate Jubilati, he wrote when he was 16, um, it, and, and it's, I think it's one of the first works he wrote really in his life in which all the elements of his style, all the elements of his worldview come together just so perfectly, so spontaneously and so joyously. And I've I spent a lot of time trying to grapple with the way classical style sort of maps onto the um, religious worldview. Um, I read a book by a theologian called um, Hans Kung, a Swiss theologian, who basically spent a very long time analysing Mozart's coronation mass and essentially saying that Mozart's faith, Mozart's lifelong unshakable certainty of redemption is what gives the music this incredibly joyous quality. He can show off, he can be florid, he can be lavish, he can be courteous, he can be gloriously expressive. It's all of a piece. For him, it's all part of a worldview in which religion was absolutely something that wasn't questioned. It was, it was there, it was central, it didn't move. It was a source of constant joy, reassurance and certainty. And in this piece that he wrote when he was 16, it just all pours out with that absolute perfection of the young, the young musician. You, you really believe this is music that's just coming from somewhere else. Um, but coming out in Mozart's voice, and I, I love it every time I hear it. Uh, I assume Mozart would appear on some of these lists. Has anyone else got Mozart on their short list? No. Interesting. <laughs> oh, that's, that's interesting. He, he basically never really finished a major sacred work in the second half of his life after he left Salzburg and went to Vienna. The, the two pieces that most people should probably choose as masterpieces, the second C minor mass and his Requiem, were he never finished. There was no commission for them, no call for them. Prior to that, he was working in the cathedral in Salzburg and adjacent to the cathedral in Salzburg and the other religious institutions like St. Peter's Abbey. Um, and, and throughout his life, he was called upon to write sacred music. And I, I did almost think of choosing this astonishing mass setting wrote when he was 12 years old. Um, it was this sort of idea that Mozart was, um, you know, his, his, his youthful stuff, we, we kind of think of it today in a slightly patronising way, is good for a 12-year-old. And I just think this mass, um, Kirkle 1, what is it, Kirkle 139, so-called orphanage mass, that he wrote for Vienna um, in the late 1760s, um, is just terrific, uh, very uh, effective, very powerful, very striking um, music by any standard. Um, it, it, it's a mass in C minor, a full-length Missa Solemnis, it says on the title page. Um, 45 minutes of music, really, is an astonishing level of inspiration, not just for a 12-year-old, but I think someone who really did, even at that age, have a sense of something going on, you know, in the but, world beyond. Well, I mean, obviously, Mozart is uh, one of the select few of, uh, of teenage composers rather ahead of his time, but James, when you were 16, were you writing sacred works at 16 was that something that was important to you to bring into your music at 16? Yes it was uh, I had been instigated into choral activity at a, quite an early age uh, not, not a boy chorus or not a treble chorus I, I became a enjoyed a, a choir as a, a weedy teenage tenor uh, <laughs> but fell in love with that world and um, we sang a lot of unaccompanied uh, Renaissance music very early on, so I'd be singing Palestrina and Victoria, some early Monteverdi, and and, and back and so on, um, uh, uh, quite early on. But but it's interesting; it, it was a completely different world to what I had been prepared for in uh, already in, in my instrumental life, as it were. And sometimes those worlds don't collide. Um, uh, it's interesting that this conversation about early music and later music <clears throat> uh, already uh, uh, is arising. I, mean, I, I found in my conversations with uh, some people in the, the musical world that they, they're either one or the other. And um, I mean, for example, um, uh, I had a very interesting conversation with a, a great oboist. I won't say who it was. He's, he's, he's now gone into orchestral management in one of the, the great European orchestras. And I, he was asking me what I was doing. And I said I was, I was writing this piece that referenced the work of uh, Thomas Luis de Victoria. But not only had he never heard a note of Victoria's, but had never heard of Victoria didn't know who Victoria was. And then I realized that his life in music had gone one way mm. and there was never any connection with not just early music, but choral music. That was quite a, a revelation. And 
it's, uh, it's, it's quite a thought, really, that we, we can live our whole lives in music and not come across certain, what well, one would say, important branches. I don't think it works the other way. I think if, if, you're, if you're involved in, if you know your Palestrina and your, your, your Victoria, you do tend to know who Brahms and Beethoven were. Uh, but it's, it's this other, other thing about uh, the instrumental world not engaging with the choral world. And uh, luckily, as a trumpeter, I was a, already a trumpeter as a teenager. I, I immediately got that uh, other world opened up to me. I had a great teacher at school who, who loved doing that kind of music with us. And it, so, yes, I, I uh, yeah. started writing choral music quite early on. And uh, one of my very first pieces was a Misa Brevis in, 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 in Latin. Yeah. Um, I think it, I think it can detect the influence of Kodai and but certainly some of the the, the early masters, Palestrina and others. In it. That that whole uh, taking a different path thing it's bothered me my whole life. It's it, it, certainly when I was a teenager. You know, when I arrived at the Royal Academy of Music, I could sing you Jonathan Harvey's Mortius Plango Vivus Voco, but ask me about Mozart and I was all over the place and it and it did bother me. And one of the reasons I think a was because it almost my entire music education was based around the. 20th century as will be demonstrated by most of my choices today um, but also as, as you I discovered mm -hmm. quite a lot of the works that I'm choosing through being a player in uh, youth orchestras and then and then spending all my weekends playing with local choral societies all the way around Kent um, as a percussionist there are only a few of us so we did all of them <laughs> so we were very busy and uh, I discovered a lot of this music through through that and actually I, I think it's one of the most thrilling ways to discover the music is to be right bang in the middle of it playing it um anyway well i'll come to my my choice in a bit we should come to fiona and uh your first main choice fiona i think i would possibly come to a, a work that is enormous and incredibly difficult to perform you can hear the struggle and the the almost the doubt um as well as the uh, commitment, and that's Beethoven's Mrs. Solemnis. I don't know if anybody else has chosen yeah. that. Uh, yeah. I think Richard, Richard is coming in there, and we'll have some <laughs> eloquent things. Oh, and today. James. I, I, I didn't hear it that early. I mean, I was probably in my early 20s, and um, I had an old uh, tape recording of it that somebody had given me, and I listened to it um, driving a, a 2CV back from my parents in Dorset. I, I couldn't really hear it very well. And the, the noise of the car was really um, very competitive with the noise of the tape cassette. But suddenly I heard this amazing violin solo. And I did do that classic thing of just pulling in. I think I was probably on a road where you weren't supposed to pull in. But if you're in a 2CV, you pull in quite often. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you also blow away. Um, and and I, I, I just thought it was a revelation. It's a bit like Fidelio in that it's not like anything else in the, in the, in the repertoire and that the, the orchestral writing is symphonic and the choral writing is complex and, and so challenging for the, for the singers. I, I do know there's one very distinguished choral director who I think resists performing it because it is so difficult. I, I think it's it's an incredible piece, um, and and this this was was a revelation for me. I was very young when I heard this. It was one of one of the first Beethoven pieces I really got into. But in retrospect, I've noticed a lot of people, uh, as Fiona has said, uh, especially from the choral world and the vocal world, saying uh, Beethoven's vocal lines are very instrumental. They're not naturally easy vocal lines, whether, whether the, the, the vocal lines of the soloists in something like Fidelio or the Misa Solemnis or even the choral parts themselves. And there is something in that. Um, you can hear that with some composers. You can hear their fingers going down on the piano, uh, placing, placing their, 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 their choir chords. Poulenc's another one that wasn't a singer, but produced this incredible, strange music, but it's certainly not idiomatic uh, in the way that it flows for voices. And I think probably Beethoven was a bit like that as well. Um, but actually that's, in many ways, it's one of his strange strengths um, that uh, vocalists and singers are drawn into making these instrumental lines work. And you can hear that going on in the Mesa Solemnis as well. The other thing is that 
I think there's a kind of a wider issue about this Misa Solemnis. I mean, just exactly how, how religious was Beethoven is another question that a lot of people are asking. In the same way, uh, Richard, uh, some, some may have asked about Mozart and Hans, the Hans Kung book that you, you mentioned is a very interesting revelation about Mozart's Catholicism. Some, some writers and musicologists try to play down the religious faith of these composers in particular. Uh, but when you actually go looking for it, whether Beethoven was a, a regular attender of masses is neither here nor there, uh, but he is a profoundly religious composer. Um, and in some unexpected ways, in, in, in the Fidelio, for example, he took the side, he took a preferential option for the oppressed and, and the poor with that marvelous uh, prisoner's chorus. Uh, and there is something religious about that. It's not just a social or political statement. There's a, there's a kind of almost a liberation theology aspect of, about that in Beethoven. And I think there's something similar going on in the Misa Solemnis, and in particular the, the Agnus Dei, which is a very strange approach uh, to this text. Uh, usually, <clears throat> um, in many musical settings of that particular Mass, the Agnus Dei, uh, a composer will attempt to invoke uh, solace and peace. Um, but in the Misa Solemnis Agnus Dei, something else is happening. The world is breaking in. Um, it's almost as if that what he's seen in his life, you know, Napoleon's marauding revolutionary forces causing chaos around Europe, is being invoked in this music. There are trumpets and drums. There, there is a bit of a tradition in that you sometimes hear trumpets and drums for God knows what reason in the Agnus Dei and in, in other mass settings. But there's something very powerfully at work here, something political, something religious uh, in Beethoven's approach. It's almost as if that um, the world is breaking in, the ontology of violence that's attempting to overthrow the kingdom of heaven. Um, which is what the world was in his day, and indeed it is, is the case now in the world, the, the sort of ideology of ever-improving human society, uh, whether we want it or not, is, kind of, is trying to invade this sacred text, attempting to sweep away the love of God, the peace of God, uh, attempting to take control imperially, uh, and to become the new spirit of the age. So in this tread of military uh, drums and trumpets. Uh, the, the, the usurper, I think, is the revolutionary clamour that sought to bring the merciful Lamb of God to its knees and lead it to the slaughterhouse. I think there's something deeply cosmic and religious and very contemporary for Beethoven's time going on at that very moment in the Agnus Dei. I'm very interested in this idea, Richard, uh, that a composer doesn't necessarily have to be a devout um, religious, religious person of any kind to actually write great religious sacred music. Well, it, it's, it's sort of two things. I mean, there's, there's two, two, things, two subjects at play there. I mean, in the contemporary world, there are composers who, I, I mean, I, I was thinking about Verdi's Requiem. Here's a man who sets himself up as a very anti-clerical, very, you know, ostentatiously unreligious and, and wrote that Requiem, of course. But then in the... Before that, I think before the sort of mid 19th century, um, it's almost impossible for us to understand now, if, certainly if you're brought up in a secular tradition, the idea of a world in which it, it was just a given. That was the default position of any intelligent, thinking, feeling person, that you lived in a, in a world inhabited by God, um, that the divine order was beyond question, it existed, it was a reality, you had it since your from your birth to your death, it was just always there. I think that was the case with Mozart. I was talking a few weeks ago about Mozart's letters. One of the bits that gets cut out of the, the letters quite a lot in some editions is a bit where Leopold is asking uh, Mozart if he's carrying a marrow bone with him in his pockets all time to ward off rheumatism. And this is deemed to be irrelevant to our understanding of Mozart, so editors have just cut this out. And equally, I always think about when I, when I visited his birthplace in Salzburg a few times now, but they, they have a, an object there called the, the Loreto Child. It, it's an image of Christ, and modelled on one in a sort of pilgrimage church near Salzburg, which has been beautifully adorned. It's dressed up in the most florid 18th century, it looks almost like a ball gown. It's amazing 18th century dress, which at least belonged to the Mozart family and was revered by them. Um, it was an expression of a very particular kind of South German 
Baroque um, Catholicism, I think. It, it looks astonishing from a 21st century secular point of view. Um, but this, this sort of incredible, this little doll, this sort of figure of Christ, dolled up looking like a little 18th century aristocratic child in this glorious little costume, um, was to them a source of genuine comfort, of reverence, um, access to another world. And, and Mozart, I think, didn't need, he was a churchgoer. He clearly, throughout his letters, throughout all his life, he was um, discussing um, his relationship with God, his relationship with religion. Um, I don't think he was ostentatiously pious by the standards of this or any age, um, but he didn't need to. He he knew what he was doing. He knew his relationship with God. It was sort of that's beyond question. And he just expressed this as naturally and spontaneously as expressed everything else. I, I think the interesting question with Beethoven is that we, um, our picture of Beethoven now is this sort of enlightenment superman, this kind of you know, the musical rebel, the revolutionary, we're constantly told. And the Mrs. Solemnists, for me, the fascinating, the incredibly touching thing is here is this man where, you know, we're used to seeing as the epitome of individualism, of heroism, of struggle against, and um, here he is basically himself absolutely struggling with something immeasurably vaster and greater than himself, overcome by it, um, trying with such incredible, almost painful sincerity to get this music onto paper. Um, and I mean, for me, um, I struggled with it for many years. I knew it was by repute meant to be one of his greatest works. I, I struggled to get into it. But the performance that actually got me into it was an amateur performance by a choral society here in Litchfield who manifestly could not sing it. Um, but they wasn't going to stop them singing it. And, and they did. And, um, and it was, you felt the struggle. You felt the sincerity. You felt um, this sense of the presence of something great and vast that nonetheless they're going to try and draw close to. And, and they, they did, in a way. And, and the music really, really, really touched me that night. Fiona, you were, you were going to come in on that. With the Mrs. Solemnist, when you have the high tenors at the start of the Resurrexit, and you can hear them really straining, and very few can really do it. But it is as if it's, that's part of, it's absolutely written into the music, that, that angst. I really struggled and didn't struggle with this one. Um, in a way, it was quite easy for me to come up with a short list of, of sacred works that I really love. But what, what I struggled with was the reason why I love them. Uh, religion has played absolutely no part in my life whatsoever. And yet, of course, as a musician from the beginning, it's always been a part of the music that I've played and the music that I've listened to. So I was trying to sort of figure out what it is about the pieces that touches me or, or, or you know, affects me or just thrills me. Um, if it isn't necessarily the connection between the words and the and the music. And uh, I realised that at least with a couple of my choices, it is purely the music. And that when I was a teenager, or maybe even earlier than that, listening to this music, the words, in a way, weren't the important thing for me. It was the sound it was making. Um, I'm sure that's quite common with, with lots of people, and particularly with texts, maybe that when you're very young, you don't really understand. Um, so the first impact that it, that it has is the noise it makes um but the the one of my choices uh, I, was, I tried to uh, most of them are 20th century inevitably with me again but tried to think of ones that perhaps the others might not choose um but but my first choice is ligeti's requiem and it really is because of the noise it makes there there is no other piece like it is there um it's just those textures those sounds that we we know of, of Ligeti anyway, but the fact that they're also in the voice. I mean, Atmos Atmosphere is one of my favorite pieces and that's orchestral uh, and with those amazing mass chords of, of just pure sound. And here it is in instruments, but also uh, vocally as well, which I just think gives it that, uh, such an, another dimension. And uh, as I said, I think there really is nothing, nothing else quite like it and it stirs me every time. And um, there is something extraordinarily powerful about it. And it, maybe it's just the sort of overwhelming sound that it makes that kind of go, washes over you in, in, in such a way. I've never heard it live. Ligeti's music isn't performed anywhere near as many times as I, it would, I would like, um, particularly the, uh, the, the big works. But there's, I guess, a, a good reason for that. They're quite expensive to, to put on and also incredibly hard often. That's my, my first choice is Ligeti's Requiem, merely because it really, I think, stands alone in its sound world. Yeah. Anyone have any I remember comments? having a similar reaction to his Lux Eterna, mm -hmm. uh, which is for 
is it 16, so I can't remember, uh, 16 solo voices or, or so on. It's of that ilk, as it were, but it's unaccompanied. Fiendishly difficult to perform because of all the chromaticism and so on, but uh, what, what a revelation uh, to hear what voices could do um, wow. coming at the voice and, and the choral sound from a very different place to some of the music we've been talking about already. Uh, an amazing uh, imagination. Well, and, and I mean, we should mention that both, well, both those pieces are used famously in 2001 Space Odyssey, uh, directed by Stanley Kubrick, um, which I, I'm sure it was the first place most people heard that music. Um, and Ligeti didn't have any idea that it was being used either. Um, but he, I, I think there was, if I remember rightly, there was some sort of case that was going to be brought against the studio for um, unauthorised use of the music in the film. But then the then the royalty checks started coming in and suddenly it's amazing how people's minds can be changed by such things. <laughs> of course. <laughs> anyway, so uh, James, what about your, your next selection? Yes, well, I'm going back in time uh, again, maybe not as far back as uh, the 12th century. Uh, and I wanted to choose, because of where I'm from and who I am, I wanted to choose a Scottish composer. And I've chosen as my third choice, as it were, uh, um, the uh, pre-Reformation Scottish composer Robert Carver, uh, Scotland's greatest composer from that time, and in particular uh, his 19-part motet, O Bonne Jesu. Um, Carver is somebody that uh, I, I was aware of, again, uh, there's a great pride amongst Scottish musicians that there's this figure from back then who wrote this very ornate music. I suppose the nearest equivalent is the, the Eton Choir book sound. Um, so we're talking about the early 16th century. He was born in 1485, so he'd be writing music um, during the reign of James IV, I think, in Scotland. Um, so long before there was even a Britain, long before the Union of the Crowns. And um, there is, I mean, it's very ornate music, quite difficult music to sing, uh, but, but the likes of the 16 now do sing a lot of it. Uh, there's a wonderful 10-part mass, um, uh, but the 19-part motet is, is just astonishing. It's getting into that Thomas Tallis, Speminalium territory. Um, and, but why 19? I, I think... There's, there's lots of reasons for it. It's probably written for a, a royal occasion. He was a monk at Schoon Abbey, and um, the, the king would attend liturgies there. Um, the, Jesus is mentioned the word Jesus, the word Jesu, nineteen times in this kind of halo of sound where the counterpoint stops and then there's this amazing moment of homophony uh, just where the, the, the same chord is sung twice to the word Jesu. Uh, but from, from there, uh, the, the music kind of collapses into these over, uh, over, uh, over layered um, uh, polyphony. It, it's, it's an astonishing feat. Um, I just, I just think it's, it's one of these, these great... Uh, what, what composers even today can learn a lot from the great polyphonists of the past, and I'm still learning a lot from the likes of Carver and Talis. I've just written a 40-part motet uh, as a companion piece for the Talis. And I, I eventually did get to write my own setting of the, the same text, O Boni Jesu, um, not 19 parts, but the, 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 Carver, the Carver setting is incredible. I'd really suggest that the people would, would find a lot in it. Fiona? I'd just uh, throw in, 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 a, in a general um, capacious way that anything from the Eton Choir book would come on my list. They're composers whose names are not forgotten if you're interested in music of that 14th, 15th century period. But um, there's not much known about these, these figures, but they wrote the most glorious stuff. The name to look for would be Cornish, would, uh, with a Y, um, stands out uh, among many. And John Shepherd, who we talked about in another episode. Um, and also, James mentioned Talis, so I would, I would have added the um, Lamentations of Jeremiah as a very powerful piece that is um, quietly effective and then ends with a wonderful major key coming out of the, a very dark um, contemplative piece. Um, so I, I'm not sure it's 
absolutely in my in my short list, but it's generally in my consciousness. <laughs> well, why don't you throw in another one that is on your short list? Uh, well, we haven't mentioned Bach. Um, I think I'd have to say quite <laughs> quickly the St. Matthew Passion or the B Minor Mass or indeed the St. John Passion. And it, <laughs> luckily, I don't really have to choose. That's James's job. But um, the, the St. Matthew Passion has been one of those pieces that's been with me most of my uh, listening adult life um, but the B minor mass is unlike anything else and has power that well I, 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 it's very hard to talk about these pieces when they're so deeply inside you I mean did, would anybody else have chosen some Bach <laughs> I, I absolutely believe, assumed that Bach. would be right there of course and all the we cantatas should, the Magnificat yeah. the Easter Passion they're, they're all there for me <laughs> Well, I, I didn't doubt that other people would choose Bach. And, um, you know, he's, he's someone I, I admire more than love, I think I would say. But I'm very aware of how central he is. And I, I, I knew that he would be chosen. I felt I could fairly safely leave that to other people and concentrate on the music that's <laughs> closer to the heart of my, my listening and my musical world, really. It, the impact is never diminished mm. it's with Bach. It's always astonishing. It always surprises every time. Uh, that's what I find. People always seem very keen... Uh, to stress that Bach was working to order and that it was just a day job and, and all that kind of stuff. And then, but then you hear the music and you, it can't, it can't just be that, can it? You can't just write music like that just because it's a job. Can you, James? Yeah, well, sometimes the, the day job thing is, 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 is what gets the juices flowing and uh, having to respond to the needs of others in his case, his, his ecclesial community, where he had to produce music that would be used for other people's prayers, uh, which is the, the purpose of this music, um, is a huge responsibility. Uh, it's, it's more than just writing music for entertainment, not that that's all that we do, but, you know, there was, his, his concept of the concert life is very different from ours. Um, so he would be writing music that he knew had to, in a sense, get under the skin and into the souls of the people, not just performing the music, but hearing the music. They were using this music as a, an, an aid to prayer, as a, a vehicle for taking their thoughts and reflections to the altar of God in front of them. And that's a huge responsibility. As someone who has, has written music spe specifically for liturgy, as well as the concert hall, um, there's a different mindset at work. And uh, I think I understand what was going on in, in Bach's mind when he wrote these wonderful pieces. So I, I didn't choose, I didn't put Bach down as one of my five because I knew, I knew someone else would. Uh, but certainly uh, as, a, as, a, as a, an outlier, I, I would flag up uh, Bach's Magnificat. Um, uh, um, because it's a very different kind of piece from the, the passions. The passions are, are the pinnacle of, of human achievement, really, in, in, in Western civilization, of course. But there's something about that opening chorus in the Magnificat that is just sheer, unadulterated, holy joy. And I remember hearing it as a, a student, and a, 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 a still at school, hearing it for the first time and thinking, this, this is what joy is all about. This is what musical joy, this is what sacred joy is about. And, um, and look at those vocal lines and just how instrumental they are and how hard they are, uh, even today. You, you, wrote your, you wrote a St John Passion. Uh, I went to it. Uh, it was for the, uh, for the 80th birthday of Colin Davis uh, at the Barbican with the LSO. Uh, did you not feel a, a, a bit of a weight on your shoulders, given the, the, uh, the already existing St John Passion that everyone knows? The, the, why did you choose that particular... Yeah title on that, that, that particular text? Uh, well, first of all, yes, the weight was very heavy. Uh, and I think every composer in the era since Bach who comes to the Passion settings feels that weight. It's like this frightening ghost over the, your shoulder haunting you, uh, knowing that um, you realise that whatever you do, you're not going to match uh, that, so you've got to take a very different route. My choice of uh, back of the St John, and to be honest, I want to write them all. I've since written a St Luke. I'll probably get round to the other two eventually, but St John was my first because it's the one I knew best. Uh, it's the one that's used every Good Friday in Catholic liturgy, and I was used to singing it in in plain song versions. 
um, uh, in the simplest versions there were, in music that goes right back to the Dark Ages, actually, in, in its contours and outlines. So I kind of grew up with um, the most simple uh, recitation, musical recitation of, 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 of that text. So I was, that was a way in for me into something that, he, that predated back a musical consideration that went right back to in liturgy since the 8th century. Uh, Richard, have you, another choice from you. I was going to sort of jump on um, a century again, um, something from the Romantic era. And um, I know this isn't a work that, um, I, this is a work that seems to polarise people a great deal. Um, but it's in The Dream of Gerontius. Um, I say this because I can't think of any um, piece of music which on first hearing has actually given me, brought me closer to religious belief. Um, and it wasn't easy. It was a piece I found very strange and off-putting um, and attractive on the first listening. Um, second time around, it was as if the sort of veils fell away. Suddenly the absolute beauty of this music, the sincerity, um, it's deeply romantic, obviously. All the armory of romanticism is brought in there. I think, I think Elgar once said um, in a talk that um, it's impermissible for a modern composer of religious music to be ignorant of Parsifal. Um, so obviously there's that element of Wagner in there, but it's, I don't know, it, it sort of puts across these the ideas, these various concepts that are quite thorny theological concepts in a way that just has such a sensuous, such an emotive, such a direct, sweet, tenderness about them. Um, there's so many phrases and little moments um, when Newman's texts and Elgar's music come together um, that just sort of stick with me over and over again. I just find coming back to them like favourite lines of poetry. Um, that line about um, sound is like the rushing of the wind, um, the summer wind amongst the lofty pines. Um, the moment when the angel says, you, I cannot now cherish a wish which ought not to be wished. And the, the music at that point and the final hallelujahs, the double basses low behind behind the very deep, deep below the chorus. Um, and I say, it deals with some very knotty theological concepts in this gloriously romantic, gloriously straight to the heart way. He never called it an oratorio. Um, I think he simply said it was a choral setting of Newman's poem. Um, and you know, his own relationship with religion seems to be a very complex and ambiguous one. But um, put it this way, I mean, I mean basically the, the dean and chapter of Worcester Cathedral refused to have it performed for many years into Algar's own life because they felt it was uh, such a potent piece of Catholicism. Um, and I think that certainly argues for it as a, as a religious work. I used to loathe um, Dream of Grontius when I was younger and I, 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 like a lot of Elgar actually, it took me a long time to, and I love Elgar's music now, maybe it's to do with age as much as anything um, but with Dream of Grontius used to be performed by it seemed like every single local um, choral society for, for years and as percussionists your only real big moment is when God comes out and appears uh, when suddenly you need five percussionists whereas in the previous one hour you've only need, needed two um, and, so, and so you have to sit there for a very very long time waiting for God to appear and then boom because there is it is just one bar isn't it of, of a, a big crash with everything for one, for one instant every instrument in the orchestra must exert its utmost force i think he writes exactly that the and, the bottom and, and, he, and, he, he, and he put that bit that passage in um i think after he'd finished the work at the goading of his editor jager <laughs> basically said look well i understand you don't want to try and do this you don't want to go there try and present god in music um you'd probably take a rich strauss to do that i get you don't feel you're really up to it and elgar of course you know Jay knew exactly how to sort of prick his creative self-esteem, his sense of pride. But um, apart from all that, I don't know. I mean, the percussionist perspective is always an interesting one. I've, I've only played, <laughs> I've only played, I played a couple of times in amateur or scratch orchestras as a cellist. And I, that, I mean, Elgar's string writing. If you're a string player, you view Elgar very differently, I think, from how percussionists. It's it's like playing a cello concerto. It soars that mm. music, those lines. They just fall into the hand. You just every minute. Of it, of that score is just a joy to play. Fiona? Yes, I, I, I played in it um, as, as, a, as a student and I sung in it and I, I, I always feel much more comfortable with part one than part two. But then I've heard performances that have absolutely had the enormous force of as if it were one of the greatest pieces of music ever written. And if a, if a piece which you sense may not be the greatest piece written, ever written, but if it can speak to you in that way, then it justifies quite a lot of listening, I think. It's, it's, it's got a lot going for it. 
Well, actually, I, I, I think you're right. We, Gronchis is one of those pieces that has to be done right. I think it can be done wrong or be boring very, yes, I, very easily. I heard um, Mark Elder conduct the Halle a year or two ago. He looked as though he'd lost about three stone in the performance <laughs> and, and, and it looked exhausted. And that commitment really conveyed itself to the audience. Yes, I was going to choose The Dream of Gruntius too. And it's, it's not unconnected with Wagner. Wagner's been mentioned, of course. Um, he, went, he couldn't have written The Dream of Gerontius in the way that he did without a knowledge of Parsifal. I, I'd like to tell you about how I came to The Dream of Gerontius. Uh, I was a teenager um, when I first encountered it. I think it was uh, a, an A-level set work way back in the late 70s. And that, that's when I first encountered it. And... Um, um, I, I came, as it, came at it as a, a, as a young practicing Catholic and uh, I was, I'm aware of the, the controversies about the piece and the fact that it was bowdlerized and uh, in a sense a, a difficult piece to perform in, in Worcester Cathedral and some of the other places for about 10 or 20 years after its first performance. I was aware of all that. And I'm also aware uh, that of the difficulties that the, the Newman text gives people. Um, it's, it's very specific. It deals with a, a, a peculiarly Catholic understanding of, of the afterlife and, um, and what happens at death and where we go and our relationship with God and, and so on. But it's, a, it's a, an understanding of, of that relationship that I grew up with. Um, it, it felt as if uh, I was. Uh, it felt as if I, I, I was seeing a kind of um, reality TV show when I first uh, encountered the Dream of Gerontes. It felt just so real, because it's what my parents understood uh, as the way that life and death is. It's the way that my grandfather's generation understood the way that life and death is, and my grandfather's generation. Um, almost could touch Newman. Uh, it, it felt like uh, my world in a strange way, but I'd never heard it uh, expressed in music before. Yes, of course, that there's great Catholic works of art from the past, but there's something peculiarly 19th century about this um, Catholicism, um, the kind of things that would have been discussed in the family home, certainly at school, and in the churches, uh, the little churches I would go to, they, they, they were all, all completely au fait with Newman's understanding of, of life and death and, and that journey towards God, which involved purgatory. And to hear it put to music was just astonishing for me. And what music? Music that um, had been shaped by an encounter with Parsifal, shaped by an encounter with Wagner, a composer that I had just fallen in love with in, in my teens. So uh, coming to terms with uh, the dream of Gerontius uh, at that early um, um, stage in my life was, was a profound moment and it's never left me. I've gone sometimes, I've become skeptical about Elgar, and, but it's always come back. And I, I, I do think now, uh, having come back full circle, that Elgar is one of the great composers and um, one of the great international composers. And I, 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 I would argue that um, in, in conversation with, with many musicians from abroad who uh, in some countries don't, sometimes don't really get British music. Uh, but I think Elgar, and particularly this piece, which is his masterpiece, um, it, it says a lot about the, the British musical tradition at that time in history. I wondered whether anyone had, might, might choose Stravinsky who's a rather an interesting example here uh, with a sort of turning to Russian Orthodox Church a little bit later on in his, in his life and then producing a, a, a few rather brief um, but important sacred works. Fiona? I think the Requiem Canticles that he wrote at the very end of his life, very condensed miniatures, really. Um, it was a very, it's a, it's a powerful piece and the Symphony of Psalms would be any on a long list of mine. Um, but a very fascinating, I mean, his attitude to religion, I think, was quite conservative and the music itself is always, whatever he's doing, in whatever phase of his life he is, he manages to be revolutionary. So it's an interesting uh, contrast, but, but, but beautiful pieces as well. Richard? Well, I, 
I, I, I thought of the Symphony of Psalms as well. Um, it also occurred to me, really, just listening to it, um, what James said at the beginning there, composers, almost our whole work, um, or large parts of their work, can be regarded as religious, which does not outwardly appear to be. And I, I was writing earlier this year about the Symphony in C, and of course, no one ever says, no one mentions this in programme notes, because it's deeply embarrassing to the modernist mindset that such a figure like Stravinsky should be a man of faith. It's a symphony of C is headed, this, this symphony composed of the glory of God. Um, and it's his most, it's a witty, complex, sophisticated, ironic take on the classical tradition. Um, there's nothing outwardly sacred about it. Um, there it is at the top, just like Haydn wrote on his scores, begin every score um, by praying, you end every one with the last day. And there's Stravinsky, um, this symphony composed of the glory of God, simple as that. In my mind, I confuse that dedication with the um, symphony of Psalms, which you'd assume that would the logical thing to put on the score but no the symphony in C and it's, it's it's that world view and that's a surprising thing to find in the 20th century and it's a surprising thing to find in someone we like to think of as an iconoclast um as a modernist um, find it in Schoenberg as well at the end of his life it's surprising isn't it well I mean this is the paradoxical thing about Stravinsky he, he was as conservative in his theology as he was revolutionary in his music making but you're right he was a man of faith uh, he, set the, he set the Mass, he set the Psalms, and, and little prayers like the Ave Maria and um, the Our Father and so on. Um, it, it, it's interesting that it's, it's an untold story about mod, modernism and modernity in the 20th and now the 21st century, that, that the search for the sacred amongst composers never went away. Uh, it's there in all the major composers of the 20th century, you know, seminal figures that we've mentioned already that made an impact on the development of music in modernity, Stravinsky, and also Schoenberg. Schoenberg reconverted to a practicing Judaism um, when he left Germany in the 1930s, and his later music is absolutely infused with that Jewish character, Jewish theology, um, Jewish spirit. Uh, it's no surprise to me that John Cage went to study with uh, Schoenberg. He saw in, in Schoenberg a fellow mystic. Um, and, you know, he pursued his own search for the sacred in later modernity through his own interest in the ideas and indeed the religions of the Far East. I, I cite the example of 433, uh, this rather notorious piece, um, a kind of uh, uh, nihilistic, almost... Uh, uh, play uh, with aesthetics and silence and, and the absence of anything. The original title for that was Silent Prayer. And I, I think that there's something about Cage and indeed a ho whole range of modernist composers that, uh, that uh, can't hide this inescapable search for the sacred that's been there uh, amongst composers all these years. And... Um, it will probably be acknowledged someday eventually, but you're, you're right, Richard, there is an embarrassment about it in modernity that these things still are still around. Fiona? It's extraordinary we've got this far without m mentioning Messiaen. Um, mm. Every note he wrote is prayer, as far as one understands, and uh, I don't think he wrote much choral music, or it, I think it's a, um, a sacrum convivium that he wrote, which is quite a short choral piece, but otherwise, every, um, this is opera, St. Francis of Assisi, um, but everything else is in every note of his orchestral piano writing. And he, he taught some of the great avant-garde composers from Boulez um, onwards. So that, that's a very interesting junction of attitude and thought. I'm going to throw in a controversial one, which will horrify yeah. a lot of people. And that is uh, Leonard Bernstein's Mass, um, which was uh, which was called famously by one critic, I think, Mass the Musical. And I totally get it. I, I, I absolutely understand where they're coming from. Uh, it, I mean, as it happens, I think it, it's got some of Bernstein's greatest tunes in it. Um, <laughs> But there's something rather wonderful about it. I, I, it it's kitsch. It's very much of its time, uh, early 70s. And uh, it is that extraordinary mix that I think only Bernstein could do and not necessarily get away with uh, a mix of music, like Broadway hit tunes as much as quite serious, actually, avant-garde uh, music in there and that's I think one of the reasons why a lot of people have difficulty with it is because there is this 
massive disconnect perhaps as some people would see between some of the some of the some of the pieces of music but actually at its core i think it it's genuine I, I, again with with bernstein i think a lot of people misunderstand him a bit he is a heart on the sleeve man but i go with it i I'm, and i love the music i love all of the music in this piece it was the, my local library in maystone had the score and uh, I used to sit and listen to the recording on headphones in there and follow this big score. And I, when, when the library uh, had a big sale, uh, one of the, one of the th scores they were selling was that, and I bought it straight away and th there it is. Uh, but I, I got to know it best through the album first on, on vinyl, loved the music then, and then got, saw the score. And the most amazing thing for me was that to discover that at the end of the score, it says that it was the score was signed off on the 9th of September 1971, and uh, that was the day I was born. So there you are. So it will be a controversial choice, and I know a lot of people listening to this will think, "How could you? You might just as well choose Jesus Christ Superstar." And indeed, I would, because I still think Jesus Christ Superstar is a fantastic piece of work, and Andrew Lloyd Webber's best. But uh, I think there's a lot in Mass that people don't haven't heard. Funnily enough, it's a piece that's really started to become quite popular again. People have started performing it. It's quite an expensive piece because yeah. big forces and different kinds of forces. You've got the, the sort of standard or orchestra, but you've also got a pop band and you've got a more sort of Broadway choir. You've got a, a, a regular chorus. There's a lot of different things in there. So it is quite a difficult one to perform. But anyway, I thought I'd throw that in there because uh, I love it and I don't care who knows it. Shall we go to James's final choice? It might be controversial as well. And I suppose I'm chancing my arm about this one, but I think I can make a case that this could be included in the pantheon of great sacred uh, works of art. I said at the beginning of this discussion, there's a lot of uh, argument about what makes music sacred from, from those who are looking for the, 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 the next thing for their choir at church to sing to... Bernstein's Mass, and, 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 and there's, there's a whole load of Bernstein uh, that's influenced by his Jewish faith as well, which is, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's books to be written here about the theology of 20th century music. Uh, for, my, for my last choice, uh, it's, I go back to the 19th century and to Richard Wagner. Now, Wagner's faith, as we know, it was shaky at best, sometimes all over the place be between a Lutheranism that he, he would have been brought up in to a late discovery of Buddhism uh, with a strange Eucharistic detour in, in Parsifal. And like most 19th century German leftists, he was very anti-clerical at various points in his life. Um, but Wagner's significance in the 20th century search for the sacred, and that's something we've, we've talked about already in, in connection with a whole range of um, different composers, um, was explored controversially and provocatively in Roger Scruton's book, Death Devoted Heart, Sex and the Sacred in Tristan and Isolde, which was written in 2004. Uh, I'd just like to quote what he says about Wagner. He says, even if Wagner the man had no place for religion, however, Wagner the artist was entirely given over to it. What we see on the stage and hear in the music are human beings steeped in a religious form of life, surrounded by supernatural powers and living, as it were, on the threshold of the transcendental. And in fact, Michael Tanner, in his 1996 book on the composer, des describes Tristan and Isolde as one of the two greatest religious works of art of our culture, the other one being Bach St. Matthew Passion. So what's religious about Tristan and Isolde? Um, was it not Parsifal that has all those big Holy Communion scenes? Well, there's something Eucharistic uh, in Act 1 uh, of Tristan 2. Let's just recap uh, what the story is. Tristan has been sent from Cornwall by his master, King Mark, to capture Isolde from Ireland into a loveless arranged marriage. She despises Tristan and he cares nothing for her. An intervention, divinely hatched but uh, delivered by human accident, introduces a love potion to the drama. And through drinking from the chalice, the two protagonists are lost to love. They fall in love with each other, um, but more importantly, allow themselves to be 
uh, given over to the power of an all-consuming, numinous force. Love devours them, in fact. And this is achieved through the mystical sharing of a communion cup. The symbolism of this is, of course, erotic and pagan, but there's something else there, a profoundly theological understanding of the power of love and indeed the numinous force of love, which makes Tristan and Isolde, I believe, a piece of sacred music. Fascinating choice. Richard? Well, it's, it's an astonishing thought. I, I, I haven't yet got round to reading Roger Scruton's book. Um, I've read a lot of Michael Tanner's work my, as my colleague at The Spectator. And we, we, we chatted about Tristan and about, about Wagner more widely. And um, I think he described it once as a critic proof work. Every time I see the piece, I'm, I'm drawn deeper and deeper into it. You can't pull yourself away from it, it's, it's overwhelms. Um, simultaneously, if one tries to apply rational thought to it, if one thinks through the implications of the, certainly the superficial implications of the drama, they're, they're appalling. Uh, they're, they're, they're horrifying, they're, they're, they're irre- irre- irreconcilable with what we understand by, by life and by morality um, in the modern world. Um, and yet at the same time, it feels so right, so truthful, so overwhelmingly honest. And I'm absolutely fascinated by what James is saying, because that is a perspective into the work which um, I had not, um, it had not seemed as obvious to me. Um, certainly, like he says, it does with parts of power. It's, it's, an, it's something I'm going to have to think very, very hard about. It's, it's a piece that troubles me immensely. At the same time, absolutely, you know, I adore it. Um, it I can't pull myself away from it. And it's um, and the implications of it, I, again, I find very, very hard to square. What Michael Tanner has said has been quite helpful to me. And what, I, I clearly have to go and read what Roger Scruton has said as well, this idea. Certainly, I understand the, the idea of it as if one sort of detaches the idea of love from the sort of sensual physical thing and assumes a sort of level of um, religious symbolism in the work. Um, I, can, I can see all sorts of things opening up there and that really, really is extraordinary thought. As we uh, wrap up now, I want to, we've heard James's five. Are there any others, uh, Fiona and Richard, that you think absolutely must be thrown in, Fiona? I think there are a lot of contemporary composers and we've acknowledged James's own contribution. But people like Arvo Pert and mm. Tavener and, um, and, and the people that have sung a lot, like um, John Rutter, Bob Chilcott, Judith Bingham, Eric Whitaker, they have made important contributions to choral life. And a lot of that music is religious. So although I'm not singling out one, I'm just acknowledging their existence. But I would single out the Nunc Dimittis by Arvo Pert, which is just an absolutely beautiful piece of unaccompanied choral singing. Um, There's there's a a little piece which I, perhaps you will know, I didn't know until yesterday, so I I couldn't honestly put it on my list of uh, (laughs) top favourites. It's it's, it's a slightly short love affair, but um, it's a piece that was attributed to Handel, but is actually by someone called Ferrandini, and it's called Il Pianto di Maria. We we haven't talked about Starbat Martyrs at all. I would have mentioned perhaps Vivaldi's or Pegolese's or Poulenc, Poulenc, another interesting composer, but this is a very short cantata and it's, it's the Virgin, it's Madonna's lament at the loss of her son. And I do commend you to it. It's, it's just a magical, it's only four or five minutes long and I had been unaware of its existence. So there's something new to listen to that is also quite old. It's early 18th century, I think. I slightly worried that uh, some choices might be a little bit cliche. And then I realised that actually the, there's usually a reason why pieces of music get played a lot. And it's because they're good. Um, I mean, I, I would always have War Requiem in there, Benjamin Britten, because it's an incredibly important work for me. And I think a, 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 an astonishing achievement. And to have the, the religious text um, side by side with the, with the Wilfred Owen text, I think is just a master stroke and never fails to, uh, to move me every time I hear it. And the other one is for a requiem. I mean, uh, another requiem, but uh, such a beautiful piece that never fails to do what it needs to do. Uh, it depends, I suppose, uh, often on which version you hear. There's so seem to be a number of versions and uh, I can never quite decide which one I like best, but uh, interesting how often it's chosen, for example, at funerals and other things that mean a lot to people, that music seems to get inside and, and really does uh, affect people. Uh, Richard, any more that you thought absolutely should be uh, in this programme? I'm fascinated by this sort of struggle in the 20th century and, and modernity between faith and, 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 well, the reality around us or what we see as the reality. And there are lots and lots of works of the 20th century where, you know, I 
adopting religious position, a composer is making a, a social stance, making a political stance, is standing against the tide of a world that really probably deserves to be stood against. Um, and the works like Penzarecki's sort of Luke Passion that came to mind, um, mm. something intensely powerful. Um, Janáček's Glaglytic Mass, which is a peculiar case in its own right. Um, again, I don't think he was a particularly conventionally religious man by any standards. But the piece I sort of picked out, really, that kept that sort of I discovered by accident and sort of has sunk deeper and deeper into my consciousness is Kodai's um, Missa Bravis, which is not a well-known piece. It's just organ and chorus. It's become a bit of a sort of C of E standard almost. Um, but I discovered it by writing about it and discovering the, the circumstances in which it was composed. Um, they were in a bunker underneath the Budapest Opera House while Soviet tanks were basically thundering through the streets of Budapest about to unleash a half century of hell on that country. Um, shells falling around them, him and his wife down there with members of the chorus of the Budapest Opera trapped waiting for the bombs to stop falling um, with just a rotten old harmonium to practice on and he, he wrote this Miss Abravis um, for them. Um, it's a stripped back mass setting just um, a few little solos drawn from the chorus, and presumably singers he was with, he was around at the time, he knew what they were going to do, um, what they could do under these circumstances. Um, and, I mean, a lot of Kodai's music, I mean, I like I like Hungarian culture, I like Eastern Europe, I spent time there, but um, the kind of, the slight, too much paprika in a lot of um, Kodai's music for me, a lot of sort of folksy Hungarianness that I, it doesn't really do it for me, it's a bit touristy, it always feels like you're being made to watch folk dance in a hotel foyer. Um, <laughs> not the case here, it's pared back, it's as if under the pressure, it's him there with his bare elements of his art and with his faith, um, in these extreme circumstances, they couldn't have known they'd lived to see the end of the month, writing this music of incredible purity and concentration and strength, um, and it, it's sort of, it's, it's, it's not a showy or grand piece, but it's one that's just sort of sunk deeper and deeper. The more I hear it, the more it's sort of the sort of strength, the austerity, the dignity, the sort of courage and the spirituality of this music. It's just, um, you know, it sort of stands for all those 20th century masterpieces that have stood against the tide of history. A huge array of music that we've discussed today. Uh, thank you so much, as always, uh, Fiona and Richard, and, and especially to uh, James Macmillan for joining us. Thank you so much, James. Just, just tell you, you said that you were composing. Are you able to tell us what actually you're composing right now? In, in the last few months, I've written a, a cantata for California, a setting of a text by the American uh, poet Dana Joya. I've written an orchestral piece for the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra, and I've just made an arrangement of some Scottish songs um, which exist in piano and voice, but, but um, I've made an arrangement for Ian Bostridge and Small Orchestra, which might be performed next year. <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I really hope so. Thanks so much, James, again, for uh, joining us today and taking the time. It's been absolutely fascinating uh, today. Please do spread the word about this podcast to those of you that are listening. We love reading your suggestions mm -hmm. for the various top fives we've discussed so far. So do keep those coming in. Uh, we're available on all the usual platforms, iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, and this podcast will also be available on YouTube. Uh, they all will from now on, uh, although you'll be relieved to hear that it'll still be audio only. Um, next week, Julian Lloyd Webber will be joining us to select his top five cellists. Really looking forward to that. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.